When all arguments boil down to power dynamics, that means there can't be any arguments. Arguments are useless. More than that, if my arguments make you feel uncomfortable, that's me using my power against you. That's me hurting you. That's me microaggressing you. And so you have to shut up, right? If, if you say something to me that hurts me, you need to shut up because you're not making an argument. Arguments are just power. So if you say something that offends me, that's you using your power against me in the same way as if you had hit me. And so you need to be quiet. That's so that the powerless can reassert themselves. It's time to shut up and do the work. You have to do the work and the work inevitably, it actually is work. You have to sit there and listen to a bunch of nonsense from people who don't make arguments, but talk inherently about how suffering they are and how difficult their lives are. And if you have anything to say on the other end, then you have not done the work. I mean, at least they're being honest a bit that it's work. I mean, it certainly is not play. I'm not sure how else you would categorize it. But if you do the work, this means you're supposed to just shut up and listen. And by shutting up and listening, we mean never having a discussion. Of course you should listen to the other person's perspective, and then you should offer your own. This is called the conversation, and grown-up adults do it all the time. But according to the left, you're not supposed to do this sort of stuff. If you speak up, you may have committed one of those horrible, brutal microaggressions, aggressions that are so small you can't even see them. They're so small. They're not just big aggressions or medium-sized aggressions. They're microaggressions, the most insidious kinds of aggressions, like dust that gets under your fingernails in terms of aggression. In fact, if you, if, you speak, if you say something wrong, the only way that we can teach you a lesson is if we create, I don't know, like a tree of oppression. And we just create this giant tree in the middle of a campus, say, and we just put a bunch of chains on it. And we call it the tree of oppression. And, um, and it's a magical place. And then we will all know that we are all oppressed, but we're not all oppressed, only some of us are oppressed. And if you make fun of the tree of oppression, you're part of the microaggression universe. Or maybe you hire Ibram X. Kendi to give the Martin Luther King Jr. legacy convocation in order to ensure that somebody has been paid off in order to assuage the feelings of the, of the broad left. Because if Ibram X. Kendi is able to ca put cash in his bank account, then this means that you have fought racism in some unknowable way. This sort of garbage has been written into the code of nearly every major institution in American life. The term that's used on campus and in corporate boardrooms across America are diversity, equity, and inclusion, which of course is the sort of happy talk, the Orwellian happy talk that you hear very often from the left. It's like when Twitter says they have a health and safety council, and what they really mean is you're not allowed to say anything we don't like, like Leah Thomas is a dude, or we'll ban you, because that's health and safety. Right? So they say diversity, equity, and inclusion. And what they mean by that is shut up. Right? They don't mean inclusion, because if you have a, a point of view that argues with their own, then you should be quiet. And by equity, they mean, again, systems of power that have to be reversed. They don't mean equality, right? because equality of rights might actually be something worth pursuing. What they mean is equity, equality of outcome. And that can only be achieved if a finger is put on the scale on behalf of marginalized groups. So this means that institutions are allowed to discriminate against Asian Americans at Harvard so that they can't get into the schools. You know, make sure that you have to correct that historic discrimination because, of course, Asian Americans were the chief beneficiaries of Harvard when it was first established by Asian Americans in the Asian dominant system that was created by Asian Americans at the founding of the United States. You press forward inclusion by saying that anybody who goes to church is really, we don't mean you. Right? If you're one of those crazy people who cites the Bible, we don't mean you. When we say inclusive, what we really mean is like everyone but you, mostly. And that's inclusion. And uh, of course, you have to teach all children that this is the most important thing. And so we have to do this at the earliest possible level. Right? You have to teach small children in Ames, Iowa to engage in Black Lives Matter at school, week of action in your public schools. These are very important things that you have to do to forward diversity, equity, and inclusion, all of which is designed to indoctrinate kids in the idea that all argumentation is stupid, that reason is bad, that discussions are wrong, and that everything is a reflection of power, so be quiet. Wokeism is destructive to the country. No democracy can survive the denial of truth, the substitution of narratives of power for discussion about ideas. And as it turns out, the tenets of wokeism are lies. When it comes to race, it is vital to understand that what makes America different from virtually every other country on earth is that the founding principles of the United States, what makes it distinctive is that the founding principles of the United States were universal, not racist. The Declaration of Independence's promise, which was not fully kept at the time of the Declaration of Independence, was a universal promise. That's not me saying that. That's Frederick Douglass saying that. That's Booker T. Washington saying that. That's Martin Luther King saying that. Right? It's black leaders saying that the promissory note had to be cashed. But that doesn't mean that the promise was meant to be evil and selective and discriminatory and that that's what's written into the DNA of the United States. Far from it. The Constitution of the United States was written 
as far as it could be when you still had half the, the nation slaveholding and half the nation free, was written to allow for the birth of the United States, but it was also written to allow a path forward away from slavery. The Constitution of the United States has a bevy of provisions that are designed to move the United States away from slavery entirely. The Northwest Ordinance, signed by George Washington in 1787, banned slavery in new territories. There are approximately 60,000 free black Americans living in the United States about the time of the founding. The Constitution of the United States banned the importation of slaves beyond 1808. This is not to deny that racism and slavery and racial evil were a deep part of US history. Of course they were. But it is to say that what makes America special and distinctive and great is that the principles that really do rest underneath the American ideal are not racist. They are universal. They are individualistic, which is, of course, why black Americans are, by all available statistics, the richest group of black people anywhere on earth. It is the reason why the United States alone, among multiracial democracies, has elected a black president. I know we're supposed to pretend that that's not a data point in favor of anything, but it turns out it's actually a data point in favor of something. Now, the United States happens to be, by all available poll data, one of the most racially tolerant places on planet Earth. And yet the idea is that Americans are racist and that if Americans aren't racist, they really are racist, right? If you say you're not racist, this is just because you haven't accepted your own racism, right? Yet deep down, we'll, we'll give you an implicit bias association test, a deeply flawed social science nonsense study where you click a little button and then it tells you if you're racist or not based on how quickly you tap on that little button. And that's how we'll know if you're a racist. We won't know that you're a racist because, say, you know, it's 1960 and you actually sponsored a law in Alabama preventing black people from going into restaurants. That's like a pretty good indication of race. No, what we will do is we'll have you click a button in your Harvard class, and then we'll tell you that you're a racist based on no evidence other than how you click that button. By the way, you can also game that test. The second time you take it, you almost invariably do better than you do the first, which is the mark of a bad test. Right? Tests are supposed to be duplicative. If you take an IQ test and one day you score 100 and the next day you score 150, that's a bad IQ test. You didn't randomly get 50 points smarter. <laughs> and wokeism is also wrong in arguing that there's no objective truth more generally. Of course, biological sex exists. Of course, biological sex exists. Men and women exist. I always choose this example because it was only a few years ago that Dennis Prager was literally laughed off the set of Bill Maher's show for pointing out that many people on the left had said that men could be women and women could be men. And Bill Maher and his sister were like, what kind of crazy are you talking? And now you have Supreme Court nominees openly saying they cannot define the word woman in hearings and then being confirmed. Okay, but as it turns out, yes, men and women exist and they are different and all reproductive capacity for the human species rests on this fundamental distinction. And it is not all that difficult to define a woman or to define a man. You can do it via genetics. You can do it via reproductive organs. You can do it through secondary sex characteristics. There are many different ways that you can do this. No, there is no random third sex. No, the gender fluidity is not a thing. A man cannot be a woman and a woman cannot be a man. These are basic facts. This doesn't mean you should be mean to anybody. But it turns out that truth is not mean, it's just truth. Truth is not a system of power, it is just truth. Facts are just facts. And as I'm fond of saying, they don't care about your feelings. <laughs> Finally, wokeism is wrong because, again, with all of the stuff that we've talked about, in the end, it forecloses discussion. And that's what we need. I mean, if we're going to have a, a functioning republic in the United States, we actually have to have discussions between one another where we're not so insulted that we go off to our safe space crying corners and weep about it. And where we have student activities that, that are set, where we have pizza and kumbaya sessions just to get away from the possibility that someone might disagree with you. You're free to do that. It's a free country. But it is also the case that if you wish to see the United States thrive in the future, it's going to have to stick to the principles that brought us here. Namely, things like individual freedom, things like objective truth, things like strong social institutions that reinforce important social rules. These are important things. If we can do all of that, we'll preserve the United States. If we can't, and if we fall to wokeness, we're in real trouble, which is why wokeness has to be destroyed. I think with the help of God, it will be. I hope you enjoyed that clip from The Ben Shapiro Show. If you did, go ahead and hit that subscribe button so you stay up to date with all our future content.